we acknowledge the sovereign first peoples of these lands and waters where we meet, the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to all descendants of those who have cared for this place since creation. This land is God's land, and God's spirit dwells here. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land under God, and we commit ourselves again to working for reconciliation in this land. Good morning to you all, and welcome to our online service of worship for today. We especially welcome the congregation of Hampton Uniting Church, with whom we are sharing alternate Sundays during this lockdown period, which we all hope will be mercifully short. I would encourage you to read your respective church bulletins for information in, on what is happening in your church and also to keep you updated on prayer requests and other news. Last Sunday, we shared with Hampton in a lovely service, which was led by Annika Opperwell. And today, our service is being led by Sam Waldron. So we welcome you, Sam, and we look forward to what you are bringing us this morning. So may God bless us wherever we are this morning as we worship him. Thank you, Sam. Welcome to Sunday worship today. Whether you're on your couch, maybe if you're a little bit naughty, still in bed, maybe you're sitting up at your dining table, maybe you have family around you. How are we together today? Well, in the unity of Christ. What can separate us from the love of Christ? Well, certainly if death can't, whatever is separating us now can neither. And what are our aspirations for today and for this week? I remember that when I was a young fella, I still have some records of what I wrote down in school when they asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the sort of things I wrote down were, I want to be an NBA basketball player, or I want to be an Australian cricketer. And I didn't even play cricket for my local team, but that still was one of my aspirations when I was maybe 10. But I want to show you this, which is something that was given to me before I could read. It's a Bible and it was given to me by my great aunt Ruth, who I can never remember, who I don't recall at all. And it says in here, presented to Sam William Waldron, great grandson. And I think, what does this say about my aspiration? What did my great aunt want to leave me with? Something which is greater than those little aspirations that I had, but the great aspiration of a life with God and knowing him through his son Christ. And as I come into a time in my life where many friends are having children, I have to think about this, what is it that I want to gift to them? Well, no greater gift than that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's sing in Christ alone. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. When striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love. Righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to say, till on that cross, as Jesus died, the love of God was magnified for every sin on him. 
Please join with us in our prayers of adoration and confession. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for all that you have done for us, for the beauty of the world we live in, for your love that is constant, for your undeserved forgiveness so freely given. Thank you for your Son, Jesus, whose death on the cross purchased our salvation. Thank you that the punishment we deserve for our sin was willingly taken by him. So great is your love for us that you paid the price to save us. Thank you that you have provided a way for our hearts to be made pure again by faith in Jesus. As new creatures, we can be set free from our past and blessed to live as new people, as your people. Lord, as your new people, we worship you today. Yet, Lord, we remain aware of the things we do that are wrong. We are painfully aware of the things we have done and the things we have not done. And yet, for those who truly love you, for those who have turned to you and have accepted your gift of salvation in Christ, you have promised to forget our sin as though it were cast into the deepest ocean, never to be remembered again. And you remind us once more that we are a new creation. God's word assures us that those who are in Christ are a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ has reconciled us to himself. Amen. And can we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Let the blind say, I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, Our selected scripture readings this morning are taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Your word, Lord, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Luke 15, verses 1 to 7. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one lost sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. In reflecting on the parable of the lost sheep, the first of our three parables of the lost, which we're going to explore together today, I'd like to tell another story. It's a couple of hundred years old, and it comes from Poland, and it's called the Clock of Krakowa. In Krakowa, there was a clock, and it was so tall that everyone in the town could see its clock face. And as people would walk by, they would look up, and they would adjust their watches to the right time because they could see the clock. And this is how life in Krakowa went on, for many, many years, until one day, the people thought to themselves, well, what an inconvenience it is 
have to look up to see the time. It causes my neck to hurt. And so they thought, what if we bring the clock down? And so they brought the clock down to halfway. And as they walked through, they had to get a little bit closer to the clock to be able to see it, but they could still adjust their watches. And they thought, you know what? Even a slight crane to the neck is still a little bit painful. Let's bring it down right to eye level. And so the town agreed and they brought the clock right down to eye level. And then they encountered a new problem. When people went to change their watches, they realized it can't be right that my watch is wrong. It would be easier just to change the town clock. And so they went up to the town clock and they would change the time. And when, after a few people had done this, the clock was no longer very reliable. And they thought, gee, this old clock has no use anymore. Let's destroy it and build something else here. What can we learn from this story of the end of the clock of Krakowa? Well, maybe this is our temptation to think of Christ as how we want to see him on our terms, rather than seeing ourselves on Christ's terms. I think in this parable, sometimes we see the good shepherd, he who keeps his sheep and calls his sheep to himself. And yet sometimes we want to make Christ into the good plumber, or the good sister, or the good brother, or something which he's not right in this parable, because it doesn't suit us, because we don't feel like we're out there as shepherds. But in doing so, we lose all of the correspondence between Christ and the prophets and Christ and the Davidic covenant, where we have the sheep and the sheep of Israel and the lost sheep. And we also lose that which is to come, which is the lion and the lamb sitting down next to each other, sharing in the peace that Christ offers us. I want to read today I've brought, in addition to this Bible, which is dear to me, though these days it's missing a few pages. I've brought some other texts that have been given to me, which I keep in a prized place on my shelf. And this one's from um, J.M. Kitsee, the South African writer, and he now lives in Melbourne, oh, sorry, in Adelaide in Australia. And this uh, little essay is called On Compassion. And he writes, every day for the past week, the thermometer has risen above the 40 degree mark. Bella Saunders in the flat down the corridor tells me of her concern for the frogs along the old creek bed. Will they not be baked alive in their little earthen chambers? She asks anxiously. Can we not do something to help them? What do you suggest? I say. Can we not dig them out and bring them indoors until the heat wave is over? She says. I caution her against trying. You won't know where to dig, I say. Towards sunset, I observe her carry a plastic bowl of water across the street, which she leaves in the creek, in case the little ones get thirsty, she explains. It's easy to make fun of people like Bella to point out that heat waves are part of a larger ecological process with which human beings ought not to interfere. But does this criticism not miss something? Are we human beings not part of that ecology too? And is our compassion for the wee beasties not as much an element of it as is the cruelty of the crow? And I love the way that J.M. Kitsee is understanding compassion as part of the world that we live in, which is exemplified to us by Christ. And this pasture that Christ is painting for us here in this parable is not some far away pasture, but it's in fact the pastures that are promised to us and that which we live in. And this compassion which he teaches to us is such an important part of who we are and what the world will look to like. Let us sing, The Lord's My Shepherd.
I fear no ill, for Thou art with me, and Thy rod and staff me comfort still. My table next selection is Luke 15 verses 8 to 10. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, for those who say that Christ has nothing in common with our female friends, why then is he talking about a woman after her lost coin? Does that not tell us something about how this woman seeking is just like the seeking of God. I heard a story about um, a church in Edinburgh in the 1970s. And maybe it recalls this second part which we see in the parables, which is not the seeking, but is the calling together in the celebration. And it asks, who are the people who are welcome at the table? And we read that she calls together her friends and neighbours to rejoice. This story in Edinburgh is about two twins who were part of a congregation and they weren't able to take part in the communion. And the reason they weren't able to take part in communion was because their intellectual um, abilities or capabilities weren't seen as fit for confession and therefore they couldn't receive communion. And there's a story that the Bishop of Edinburgh visits this church to host Mass one morning. And he asks, why is it that these two girls aren't allowed to take communion? And then the parish priest explains why it is that they can't accept it. And right there and then, the Bishop calls forth the girls, asks them a question, to which they respond yes. And then he shares the communion with them right there and then. Who is welcome at our table? Our next Bible reading is Luke 15, verses 11 to 16. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth on wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. I'd like to pause at this point in the parable of the prodigal son to think about the distance between the father and the son and to not think only of the son's position down 
coveting almost, desiring the food of the pigs, but also for the father whose love is still for his son. And as a church, there is something which we have, which occupies the distance between us and others. And that is the Lordship of Christ. And I just want to have take a moment here, and in this next song, it is well, that you might think about those who you are feeling distant from. And maybe you're feeling distant from them because we have neglected our relationship with them in some way. Maybe it's because of a physical distance like it is for the father and the son here. Maybe there's been a departure at some point and that uh, distance has um, made it difficult to feel like we are in communion with that person still or in community. And I'd like just to think about this distance and I'm going to pray at the moment for those who are far away. And then as we hear this next song, I find it sometimes a song which is very difficult to sing because to sing it is well with my soul when what we're seeing around us is not so well with us is such a difficult thing. And there's only one leap for me that can make things okay and that's the eternity of Jesus Christ our Lord and God who I have to trust is working to make all things new and working towards goodness in these things which I just cannot see how they possibly could be redeemed or resurrected or how this could be part of what it is to live a good life. And so I understand fully if as this song is playing that there is a struggle in seeing the words but I just want us to be encouraged too that that's not something which the Lord is asking us to do just on our own because he too has experienced this and his love for us is a compassionate love and he maybe when our heart rumbles in that distance has that rumble too, has that desire. Look at what he's shown us about his um, effort and fervor in seeking. Let's pray. Dear Lord, please show us the extent and the scope of your love. Lord, please remind us that nothing can separate us from your love, but that that promise is for those we think of now as well. What could separate them from the love of Jesus Christ? Lord, I pray for those who are in countries such as Lebanon, Liberia, Nigeria, in Indonesia right now, Lord. These are the uh, struggles and injustices on my heart. Lord, I pray for those who have family far away. I pray that through you, there might be an opportunity for connection. Lord, help us to pray. And Lord, I pray for uh, in our own nation that we might be able to see ourselves, yes, as citizens, but more than that, Lord, as citizens of you, as disciples of Christ, as children of God, which might take over any affiliation of its own, which is limited by land or allegiance to government and these sort of things, Lord. Help us first be know that all authority is under you. And Lord, as we bring these people for, for, before you, um, what we ask is that they might know you, that they might know your love, and that you would reveal to us how we might take part in that love today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let us sing, It is well with my soul.
Our next selection is Luke 15, verses 17 to 24. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring a fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. What is the father's response in the parable of the prodigal son? It is one where he is moved and he runs while the son and maybe while we are still in the distance. What grace is this? And the son comes forth and he has his confession prepared. He has his admission of guilt ready. But before he can even open his mouth, the father cries out, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And what is the father doing? He is honouring his son. And Galway Canal, an Irish-American poet, I think has touched on this. What is the father doing? Reteaching a thing, its loveliness. This is um, a poem called St. Francis and the Sow by Galway Canal. The bud stands for all things, even for those things that don't flower. For everything flowers from within of the blessing. Though sometimes it is necessary to put a hand on its brow of the flower and retell it in words and touch, it is lovely. Until it flowers again from within of the blessing. As Saint Francis put his hand on the creased forehead of the sow and told her in words and in touch, blessings of the earth on the sow. And the sow began remembering all the way down her thick length from the earthen snout all the way through the fodder and slops to the spiritual curl of the tail from the hard spininess spiked out of the spine down through the great broken heart to the sheer blue milk and dreaminess spurting and shuddering from the 14 teats into the 14 mouths sucking and blowing beneath them. The long perfect loveliness of Sal. And I wonder if before even this moment, in the prodigal son's moment with the pigs in the sty, if that whole image, if we can conjure that up, is met by the resurrection and the crucifixion of Christ. It's for that moment that Christ goes to the cross. And it's in that moment, at the lowest point, that Christ is willing to get down, to get n dirty, next to us in the pigsty and raise us up. And I wonder if there's something we can do this week, no matter our condition, that we might be able to make it a small aim to reteach a thing, its loveliness. In the couple of ex examples I've brought you, uh, next to these books which I prize, 
in my bookshelf, which are sort of, you know, they're the books which I'd be hesitant to give away. The Lord's challenged me a lot on what do you hold on to, Sam? And it's one thing that I probably hold on to a bit more than other possessions are, are books. And he's challenging me, no, even these things are mine. And it's a great challenge to have. And these are the books which, you know, they're a book which I can buy another copy of, yes, but maybe the meaning is beyond that because they've they reteach me my loveliness. And very often, um, some experiences that I've had and why in this part of my bookshelf there are certain things which I don't think others will ask of me. Because in that section of my bookshelf, a large number of the texts there are letters that I've received from others. They're personal letters. They're encouragements from my mum, from my dad, from my youth leaders when I was younger, from those who wrote to me when I was on a pilgrimage in Emmaus, with Emmaus. These are the texts which remind me of something, which remind me deeply of who I am. Because these people have seen the Lord and they have hope for me, which I am reminded of. And then, this is a book which I'm not sure how many people have this sitting next to their Bible in their bookshelf. This is The Secret Unicorn. And the reason that The Secret Unicorn is up there for me is because it was someone much younger who gave this book to me. I was at school and I was in the library one day and I teach the older students but I do love an opportunity to work with the kids too especially when it comes to stories. And there was a grade three girl and she tugged on my coat and she said Mr Waldron you teach my big sister would you be able to recommend a book for me? And so I recommended her a book. I think I gave her some of Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales. And she came back the next week, and I was on library duty again. And she said, Mr. Waldron, I read the book. They were fantastic. I brought this book for you. Would you read it? And I thought, okay, I've sort of entered into this transaction now. So I went home. And I read The Secret Unicorn, My Secret Unicorn, The Magic Spell. And why is it stuck with me? Because this is a story of faith. And this is a story where a child reminded me that no matter what you teach, literature or wherever you are, that these stories which remind us of our faithfulness are always valuable. And it's that gift of giving too. And it retaught me my love for children's literature, but also that the Lord's message is legible, that the Lord's message can be shared. And we can be, um, take part in that sharing in a myriad of ways. So maybe something for us this week. How can we reteach a thing its loveliness? How can we get alongside the Lord in his walking towards a sheep, walking to find a coin, setting out before his son has even um, come before him? We're going to hear the next scripture. Our final selection is Luke 15, verses 25 to 32. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me one young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered his property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
And now we come to the other son. He got angry and he refused to come in to the celebration. I mean, this is a powerful parable because unless we're arrogant enough to see ourselves as the father, to take the place of God, which hopefully we wouldn't read into, we're left with two options to see ourselves, either as the prodigal son or as the brother who is the righteous one, supposedly, who doesn't go out and abandon his father. And what do we find out if we see ourselves, well, I'm not the prodigal son. I've always stayed true to my father. Well, we see here that we become the voice of the hypocrite. Because to say that I am the one who is right is to suggest that others are wrong. And this is not what the Lord is intending. It's that the Lord is right and that we can be made right with him. It reminds me, too, of another couple of brothers in the Old Testament, Cain and Abel. And maybe Cain's question here is also on the lips of the elder brother. Am I my brother's keeper? And how we answer that question, I think, is pivotal for our church. Am I my brother's keeper? Maybe our answer is yes. Maybe our answer is no. The Lord is my brother's keeper. And what he's asking me is to go and do likewise. There isn't any retribution seen in this parable. The prodigal son returns and a festival is held. The fattened calf is slain. He comes home to a celebration. Cain's response results in the mark of Cain being put on Cain. And I wonder sometimes if we look at that, like for many years I did, as some form of punishment for Cain. But maybe there's something else in the teaching of the mark of Cain, which is that if the mark of Cain means that Cain cannot be killed, it puts an end to this, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It prevents Adam and Eve and anyone else who might have been in their family then seeking vengeance of their own on Cain for the death of Abel. So the Lord is putting an end to the cycle of murder. And here we see the Lord in his gentleness, beckon the elder brother the same way as he's called the younger to the feast to come, share with us. Let's celebrate in the return of another. And if we ask, what then are we to do? And we can ask, what, how am I to be this charitable or this generous or this gentle in my life? We might think about charity as loving those who are before us. Let's sing Amazing Grace.
As we go out today, the pastures of the Lord are before us. Let's go out with him. Let's ask him in and to invite us into what he has for us this day. And maybe he'll have something for us which is challenging. Maybe it'll be a taking up of a pen. Maybe the taking up of our hands. Maybe the sharing of a gift. Maybe the messaging of, to someone who is far from us or that a distance might see to occupy. Chesterton, the prince of paradox, he reminds me that Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. As we go out today, let us remember that sacrifice in love is what Christ has shown us how to do. Let's go and do likewise. Let's love one another. Let's see ourselves not as the righteous, but let's see ourselves openly as those who once were lost and are found in Christ. May the glory of God go before you and bless you this week. Amen.